<laughs> okay, so let's begin, okay? Everyone, hello everyone. Welcome to IMU Learning Series. If you're wondering what IMU stands for, it stands for the International Medical University, Malaysia. Okay, my name is Zed Al Sagoff. I am the e-learning manager at IMU, uh, which is in Malaysia again. Uh, in the e-learning world, I'm probably known as Zed Learn. I'm, today is not about me, so but anyway, if you want to know about my work, it's Zed Learn. You can just Google it. Okay, so basically, the IMU. IMU Learning Series is about connecting, inspiring, and exceptional educators around the world to share their knowledge, best practices, experiences, and wisdom to people like you and me. Okay? Today we have none other than Tom Coleman, who is probably the most well-known rapid e-learning designer on the planet. Period. Okay? Interestingly, if you Google Bing or Yahoo rapid e-learning, his rapid e-learning blog is amazingly ranked number one. Okay, a few weeks back, I saw two top ten rankings of e-learning professionals in the world, and on both occasions, okay, you don't need to blush, Tom. Uh, he was included. He was included in the top ten most influential edu bloggers in the world, and he's also included in the top ten e-learning movers and shakers in the world. Okay, I'll share with you the links later. Okay, both of you. I mean, everyone. And his blog has over 85,000 subscribers each week, okay? Here he shares practical tips and tricks to help people learn more about e-learning. He also manages the Articulate user community. And by the way, IMU are fanatical Articulate users. And uh, maybe we, if we interact later, I'll share you some of the stories. But at IMU, we have nearly produced more than uh, nearly 1,000 uh, articulate presentations. Okay, so we are very much using it. So your contribution to this, to IMU just being here, is just amazing. Okay, he holds Tom holds a master's in education technology from Pepperdine, and is very passionate about learning and technology. Yes, he has even rehearsed for this webinar, which shows his amazing dedication to his work. So let's give him a warm welcome for taking his time to be with us in the chat box. I want to see a lot of noise in the chat box. Okay, now I'm going to stop broadcasting and I'm going to pass it over to Tom Coleman to do his show. I will be in the chat box trying to moderate discussion and so on. Thank you very much. All right. Well, with that uh, great introduction, I think it's going to be all downhill from here. So hopefully it's not, but if it is, I've got... Uh, a site with some links and um, hopefully the links will uh, make up for any deficiencies. All right, so what I want to talk about today is, um, I just call it the secrets to becoming a rapid e-learning pro, but uh, there, it's really not about rapid e-learning uh, as much as it is just really some simple tips on how to uh, get started with some e-learning or how to transition uh, from uh, a blend. I see a lot of people, I assume, come from, uh, from, from the list. I see many seem to come from more of a, the academic environment. So uh, what might be, uh, what might be um, true to the corporate environment is probably not so much true uh, to the way the academic environment might work. Uh, especially in this area of uh, interactivity. But uh, we'll go through some of those things and um, hopefully you'll learn something. So the uh, first thing I want to look at is uh, just uh, some resources. So uh, at the top address up there is my blog address. So if you want to subscribe to that, there's a, an ebook uh, that I offer as well. It's free. And uh, I try to only post once a week and try to keep it real practical. And it's not uh, specific to the Articulate software. So uh, I'm, kind of, I'm always sensitive to the people who just need to get their work done. And uh, we just trust that if you're looking for e-learning software, we're going to be in the mix anyway. So it's very kind of an unbiased uh, approach to some of the tips and tricks. Then you can always email me if you have questions. It doesn't have to be about Articulate. Um, I, if I can't answer the questions, I'll at least try to point you in the right direction. And then if you're on Twitter, uh, there's my Twitter address. You'll notice the link on the bottom. And what I did is I put together some of the resources. And if you go to the website, you'll see that the uh, uh, a lot of the things I talk about, you'll be able to find there in more depth. 
And so all that stuff's going to be there. And then if there are any other links or things that I throw out uh, during the session, I'll try to add those uh, to that site as well. So that'll always be available to you. So I kind of have like a three-pronged approach to uh, e-learning. And I call it the e-learning story. And this is kind of what I find when I uh, talk to uh, people out there. Uh, typically what I find, and it's probably again more true for the uh, on the corporate side of things, but most people I know who are in this e-learning space were actually subject matter experts. They were good at explaining how to do something, so they ended up becoming trainers. And then somewhere in the process, uh, the organization said, hey, you need to take all of this content that you have uh, these PowerPoint slides or these classes that you've been doing, and we need to put that online. So they go out, they buy a rapid authoring tool, they convert it, get it online, everybody's happy. Uh, somewhere in the process, people start complaining that uh, this all kind of looks like PowerPoint. How do, we, how do we fix it and make it look less like PowerPoint? So then you start focusing on the visual design. And then the next stage of it is, well, how do we craft a better learning experience? How do we make it more interactive? How do we make it more engaging? And that's kind of when I ex explain that in these sessions, usually about 80% of the people start nodding their head and they say, yeah, I can kind of identify with that. So I think that's actually a pretty nice way to think about uh, developing your e-learning skills. So the first stage is this, how do I take this content and get it online? What, what are some of the things I need to consider? And I kind of talk more about kind of the consistency of getting it there. And then that second leg of it is, you know, how do I create the right look and feel uh, for my e-learning course? And, and what does that even mean? And then the third leg is, how do I craft a, a good learning experience? So that's kind of what we'll look at today. I only have uh, less than an hour, so we're going to kind of fly through it. But that link I have, uh, we actually have a little practice course with some assets where we go through it in a little bit more detail. And so if, if this kind of intrigues you, uh, you're more than welcome to go to the community site and download all that stuff and then practice that. And if you have any questions, uh, feel free to send me an email. So I always have what I call the Coolman Threes. My kids say everything I uh, mention is always in threes. So we had those three stages, the e-learning story. Uh, when you think of building an e-learning course, there's really three components to that. So the first component is, you know, what is a course going to look like? It really doesn't matter uh, what your view is on uh, the visual design or, you know, there's a lot of uh, conversation around cognitive load and, and, and all these things. It really doesn't matter what your view is. The course is going to look like something. So even if you have a white background with black text, that's a design decision that you made. So the course has to look like something. So somewhere in the process, you've got to figure out, well, what does the course need to look like? Uh, the second kind of prong or, or part of the course is what information needs to be in the course. And then that third part is, what is the person who's going through it supposed to do with the information? And then that kind of makes up, when I uh, build e-learning courses, I kind of focus on those three parts. So the look and feel of the course, uh, what information or content needs to be in there, and then what is the learner who's going through the course supposed to do uh, with that information? And that kind of becomes the basis for building a good interactive an effective e-learning course. So if we look at this first leg of it, it's, you know, how do I convert this course and, and get it online? I always try to take a practical approach uh, to what we're doing. So to me, it's really about that first step being uh, develop a consistent pro production process, develop some consistent styles and templates and things like that and then learn to use the tools that you have. And then you, as you become proficient uh, with your production process and consistency, you become proficient with the tools, then you can begin to, to broaden that. It doesn't mean you can't build interactive e-learning or you can't build good uh, looking e-learning or whatever. 
Uh, so it's not like you have to do stage one first and then go to stage two and then stage three. They all just kind of overlap. But I would say in that first stage, when you talk about converting content and bringing it online, it's, um, uh, it's about developing the consistency and, and learning to use the tools. All right, so let's talk about the getting started piece. This actually, if you see the screen here, this is actually a screen that uh, I, I recreated the screen, but it's something I got from a customer. And what you'll notice with the screen is you're not quite sure where your eye's supposed to go. And uh, if we look at some of this stuff here, you know, typically when a person is looking at a screen, uh, there's a couple of ways uh, that their eye scans the screen. They'll kind of start up here, and they'll move across, and they move kind of down like this. Or uh, they'll have like an F pattern uh, where they move like this, and they kind of come here, and they move like this, and they go down. That's kind of typical when they're doing uh, studies. Now, obviously, with different types of language, uh, that might be a little different. But the main thing is when you're looking at a screen like this, you're not quite sure where your eye is supposed to focus. So a, a core part of your design is uh, directing or controlling the eye movement across the screen. Uh, the other thing is you don't really know what to focus on. There's so many discordant elements. One is the color scheme makes no sense. That this, this is actually a mock-up of how to change a tire course. And so you've got... Um, You've got this car picture here. You've got the sky background, this purple background. Uh, there's, a, there's a logo up here. Um, this right here is your key information. Then you've got this big danger thing. And I can't remember what this is because the, the quality is not that great. But the, the thing is you've got all this information on the screen. And yet uh, the most important information is buried right down here. And you're not even quite sure why that's important or not. So when you talk about bringing content online, even if you're doing something basic, we we'll go to this next slide, this is the same information. Now, this isn't an ideal e-learning course. Um, but when we just talk about reworking your content and, and putting it out there, what this gives you here is um, you've got a clarity. So you've got a really clear um, course title. You know what the, the main topic is. Uh, you've got, you're using some good basic design concepts with the alignment, uh, the proximity, the ordering, uh, the subtitles. You're using graphics. Now, you know, the graphic is still kind of superfluous. But the, the point is uh, you're not flooding the eye with information. A person is going to look at this. They might look at the graphic, but they quickly see, okay, the graphic has no value. And then they can scan through and uh, there's an order to the information. If we go backwards and we look at this slide, uh, this one you don't even know what you're supposed to look at. It's just, it makes no sense. So the, the first thing is that process of just applying some basic uh, graphic design concepts. And, and we'll talk a little about that. And it's just cleaning it up and understanding that the eye uh, flows across the screen. How does it flow? Uh, what are people going to focus on, and then create a nice, consistent uh, look and feel. So we'll talk a little bit more about how to, how to get to that point. So one of the things I find when I talk to people and they're building e-learning courses is that uh, they don't really understand that uh, it's not all about just pouring information out there. Now, again, in, a, in an academic environment, it's a little bit different because a lot of times the interactivity that at the corporate level they may be putting in uh, into their e-learning course, in an academic environment you might not need to do that because there it might just be about the information because the interactivity is actually blended into uh, the learning experience through lectures and, and research papers and other uh, group activities they, they that they may do that's not online. So it's a little different. But essentially, when you think about a basic course design, 
Uh, there's a point where they're at, which is uh, here, right? And you want to get them here. And there's a reason they're taking the e-learning course. Where do they need to be that next day? Where do they need to be when they're done with the course? Why are they taking the course? What are you expecting from them? And then uh, from that, that becomes the basis of your objectives. So you have your objectives. It's like this is what you want them to be able to do. And then uh, somewhere in here, you've determined where they need to be. And that becomes uh, the basis for your assessment. And so if you're uh, trying to figure out uh, what to assess or where they need to be, you, you kind of step back and say, OK, if they're supposed to be at this point, how do I confirm that they're at this point? There's got to be some way that they can uh, demonstrate their level of understanding. And uh, that becomes the basis of your assessment. Now, an assessment can be a pretty basic multiple choice quiz question, which is really easy for people to do. Or the assessment can be an activity where they actually do something uh, to demonstrate their understanding. Or it could be a little interactive scenario if you're building an e-learning course, a little interactive scenario where they can apply the things uh, that they're learning uh, through some sort of decision making. And so the assessment doesn't have to be a quiz. And the objective screens, I would say, don't have to be a list of objective screens. A lot of times in e-learning, we'll start a course with, in this course, you will learn, and then we'll have five bullet points. And that becomes our objective screen. And at the end, we may have a multiple choice uh, quiz question set up at the end, uh, because that's usually the easiest thing to do. But when you're building an e-learning course and you talk about objectives and assessment, and objectives is just a way to uh, let the learner know what they're supposed to learn. And the assessment's a way to measure their understanding of whether or not they learn that. And that kind of becomes uh, the basic structure of an e-learning course. And I always go through that because surprisingly, a lot of people uh, don't build with that in mind. They just build e-learning courses with the uh, objective of just getting information uh, out uh, to the learners, but never really doing anything uh, with the information. So once you kind of have Excuse me. Once you kind of have that structure, when you look at an e-learning course, yeah, I'm, I'm, you know, with the voice dropping out, it, it's possible that uh, that it's just the the connection because uh, I'm I'm all the way in in um, Washington, so <laughs> Washington State. So uh, I'm sure that that kind of slows things down a little. Um, when we look at a, a basic course structure. Uh, even though you don't know what the course is, there's you can begin to look at courses and see they all have a similar structure to them. It's like it's like a book or a magazine. And all the books may be different, but when you look at a book, it's it's generally built the same way. You know, you've got the cover. Uh, there's a title page. There's a table of contents. Some sort of uh, chapter divisions or something. Maybe a preface. Uh, maybe there's an index or something in the back. Uh, but while they all have the same structure, they're not all the same books with the same content. They don't all look the same. So when you look at an e-learning course, uh, what I usually will tell people who are just getting started, kind of break the course down into chunks. So when you go to build a course, you know there's going to be some sort of welcome process in the course, You know, greeting them into the course. They're going to have some sort of instructions. Uh, you'll have some sort of way of stating the objectives, whether it's real engaging or it's just simple bullet list. It doesn't really matter. And then you'll have the different sections or chapters of information. And then within that, you may have like a welcome or instructions for that section with the objectives content, then some sort of assessment or summary of the section. And then you may repeat that a few times. And then somewhere at the end, you probably have an assessment structure, You know, some way to assess their understanding. You'll have some sort of a summary, a wrap up to the course, and then instructions on what to do when they're completed. So that's kind of a basic course structure. It doesn't mean the courses all have to look the same. It's just that's kind of the structure. So when you go to build a course and you're just getting started, then you can say, OK, I need to welcome. I need to figure out how I'm going to welcome the learners. I need to figure out what instructions they need. I need to know how I'm going to uh, add objectives to the course, let them know what the expectations are. And then I'm going to build a structure for 
the learning content, and then uh, I'll have my assessment and summary and those things. So it's a, it's a pretty generic structure, but it's a good one to follow. Again, we're talking about that getting started, getting content online, and developing a consistent process. And this is a good way uh, to go with that. And it makes it easy then to break up and build your courses. Surprisingly, a lot of people just kind of jump into the content. And then after they're done building the course, they start to think about, oh, I, I should probably give them instructions on how to navigate the course. Or um, I don't, you know, they build a course. I actually had a junior uh, instructional designer working for me. And uh, he had built a course, and there was nothing after the course. There was no, no sense of the implementation for it. And there was no sense of uh, what the person was supposed to do when they'd gotten to the end of the course. So that structure is a good structure to follow if you're just getting started. So you kind of make sure you're covering uh, those main areas. Yeah, I'll take some questions here when we in between the, uh, the sections. Um, and then once you build the structure of your courses, you can really begin to template some ideas. So when you think of an e-learning course, there's really only so many things uh, that you can put on the screen. So you're going to have colors and, and different things like that and, and some design elements. But when you actually look at the, the screen, you can put text on it. You can put uh, pictures or shapes. Uh, you can drop video in there. There's really only so many things you can do. And then you can add you know, interactive components. But in terms of just putting the content on the screen, there's only so many things you can do. And then when you do it, there's really only so many ways that you can lay out your content. So what you can do uh, to speed up your production time is uh, take a few different layout ideas. And this is just an example from PowerPoint that I mocked up. But just take a few layout ideas and say, OK, I'm going to I know I'm going to have a welcome screen. Let me design a few welcome screens. Or I know I'm going to have a screen with videos on it. So I'm going to have a screen where I have as much screen real estate or space as possible. I know I'm going to have a screen with some text and images. So I want to put the text on the right, and I'll put the images on the left. Or maybe I want a screen where I've got them flipped over. Uh, I know I'm going to have sections, or I know I'm going to have uh, different types of layout. So you can already begin to pre-build some layout so that when you go to take your content, and again, if we look at that first slide we have with the purple and the sky and all that, if you take content like that uh, and you want to put it into a nice, consistent, clean structure, uh, you can pre-think many of those things before you do that. Uh, somebody's asking if there's a certain layout that's effective for an e-learning. and. I don't know if there's an, a layout that's effective other than the layout that's able to get the information out there and uh, get them to learn from that. Well, the, the thing here, on, that's a good question about the templates. As somebody, uh, Benedict was asking about clients complaining uh, that the courses look the same. Well, this would be, we're actually going to go into that second segment. You'll see how we, we will deviate from this. This is really about this first stage of I've got all this content. And I don't know what to do. I want to put it online. What are some things to do? So to avoid um, some of the, the, the messiness of it, it's kind of this is the process to get there. So understanding that basic course structure, uh, pre-building some templates and some of those things so that you can get your content uh, out online and get, those, uh, get, the, get it looking good. So we're kind of taking you from that. If we go back to this slide here, um, we're kind of taking you from this slide and getting you to a point where you could design something that's a little bit more effective this way. At this point, you're not building uh, Academy Award winning e-learning courses. You're not probably going to be an e-learning superstar if you're building courses that look like this. But if you're going from this to that, this is a, this is a big improvement. And so that's kind of what we're looking at here is how do we get all our content online, and what are some ideas that we need to develop around uh, consistency. So you can, you can begin to develop a kind of a generic structure, and you can also begin to develop some templating. But now if we go to templates, going back to Benedict's question, um, 
because you create a templated layout doesn't mean that all your courses need to look the same. In this case, in these templates, it's just content left, content right. The only reason they look the same is because of um, the design element that's consistent with the backgrounds and those things. So once you change all of that, you know, you're still going to have to put your text somewhere. It's either going to be on the top, bottom, left, or right. Uh, so you, you, can, you can begin to template some of those layouts. And if you look at web, dis web page design, a lot of times they'll follow these different layout schemes, like a five-column uh, layout scheme. So that's uh, kind of where you want to go to where you have a development, uh, a model where you're able to take your content and you've pre-thought through um, some of these things. So this way you're kind of getting a clean and consistent look. So then that next stage is uh, working with your subject matter experts. The nice thing is that with these rapid authoring tools, uh, the subject matter experts can do a lot of work for you. And you just have to learn uh, to work with them and, um, and appreciate the fact that, you know, I find in my experience working with subject matter experts is many times they've invested hundreds if not thousands of hours in developing content that they were doing uh, in a classroom. And uh, you know you're coming on board as an e-learning designer, and you're taking that and trying to make it into a great e-learning course. And sometimes uh, there's some friction because uh, they have an investment. They've made design decisions. Uh, they've uh, structured their content a certain way. And so you've got to be sensitive to the fact that they're working a certain way, and you're kind of reinterpreting uh, their work. Uh, some of the things you can do when you're working with clients or with the subject matter experts or that you can create treatments. So for example, if you look at this here, while we, can't, we won't be able to go into all that detail today, but the link I give you gives you um, an example of this transition. But this is the slide we're starting with. But actually, when we get to that third leg in that, in that link, uh, you get to uh, this, um, this here, which is the same information, only you can see now we get to that design where Benedict was acting, asking about the uh, look and feel of the course. Um, so we're making a transition here. But what you can do uh, as an e-learning developer is you, you can develop some treatment. So you can have some basic to more advanced. And then uh, a lot of times when you're working with subject matter experts, if you can show them, uh, here's what the course looked like, and here's how we can go uh, to um, uh, to something that's more interactive. It's a lot easier if you can show them than it is if you, uh, if you try to, um, I lost my train of thought there. If, you, if you're showing them, it's a lot easier than if you're trying to explain it to them. Uh, the same thing uh, with templates, you know, going back to what we we're doing. A lot of times, if you can help them uh, learn to template their content, it's going to be a lot easier with you working with them uh, to get their content structured and, and, and get it developed. You know, in an ideal world, you have six months and uh, graphic artists and all these people to work with uh, to build your courses. But you know, a lot of people I talk to, uh, they have no resources and they're working you know, with one to two to three weeks to work on something. And so uh, anything you can do to speed up that process helps. And then there are some things you can do when you're working with the subject matter experts uh, to get them uh, up and running. So we can look at a few things. So a uh, couple things here, you know, you can, you can have them pull together content uh, and get all the files and things together. Have them uh, get your notes and all that if there are any assets. A lot of times in the organization that uh, you know, I find this in some of the bigger <laughs> companies is they have these marketing groups that seem to have a lot of money, and they have the cool videos and pictures and all these things. And then the e-learning people or training people have nothing. Uh, so sometimes you can go uh, to those organizations, to the marketing groups, and uh, pull some assets from them. So from your own website, if, if you have a website, and, um, and then you can have the, the subject matter experts uh, and people in the organization already begin to pull some of the assets that are available to you. And then uh, 
things that you can have them think about, you know, pulling all your, your reference content, having them already start to uh, think through the assessments. Uh, again, my conversation with a lot of people, they tend to work on the assessment last, but if you're building the course, you kind of know what they're working on and then how do we get them uh, to demonstrate that understanding. Well, you want to get the subject matter expert thinking about that at the forefront of the course and not let's build a course and now let's throw uh, 10 multiple choice questions together. Can you quickly pull some questions together? So you can get them working on that. And then here is kind of a place where you end up spending a lot of time. So getting them to uh, think through the fonts and colors and logos and some of the branding and all those different considerations you may have in your organization, uh, you can get them uh, to work on that and begin discussing that prior to actually building the course. The more you can do with the subject matter experts, the more you can do to train them on some basic uh, graphic design and some basic instructional design stuff, the better off you're going to be um, working with with them and getting them to work with you getting your uh, culture together. So that's kind of that first leg of it. It's like I said here and probably addresses some of the stuff in the chat. It's not perfect, but it's a good start. And, and again, the key is let's go from um, this kind of junky stuff and how do we get it to at least be consistent and then uh, get it working. So I'll open it up to a few questions and then we'll, we'll transition. Uh, to, I think the second section people will like because it's really practical and how do we get uh, to something that you have the right look and feel for your course. So anybody have any questions or how do you normally do this with the uh, with these sessions and, the, and, and questions? Just add some questions in the chat. All right, so what I'll do is we'll I'll transition to the next section, and then um, what we'll do is, as I see some questions in there, I'll can, I can kind of pause and then answer some of those. So if you have some questions, go ahead and ask them, and, and I'll try not to miss them while I'm talking. All right, so this is a big area, and this is an, I'm going to show you some stuff that I think will uh, help you uh, develop uh, or approach your courses in a slightly different way and hopefully help you rethink how you're developing the look and uh, feel of the course. And we actually have an exercise. Normally, I would do this as a full day workshop, and so this would be one of the exercises we do. But we'll walk through the exercise, and we actually have all of that available in, the, uh, in that one of those links that I shared uh, earlier. So uh, let's see, we talked about that. So the first thing you want to think about when you're thinking about visual design is that you create meaning uh, with the content that's on the screen. And I'll show you an example from somebody's work. I, I modified it so that they wouldn't be offended if they saw it. <laughs> but I'll show you an example. But here's a simple example of how you can control um, the, the meaning of the content on the screen. The first thing is everything on that screen is something that you placed on the screen. It's not there by accident. It's not like you went, got a cup of coffee, and came back and there was a piece of clip art on the screen or a muscle man or something. Um, that whatever's on the screen is there because somebody's placed it on the screen. So uh, everything on the screen is there intentionally, and everything on the screen contributes to uh, the meaning of what's on the screen. And you can see that in all sorts of ways. Uh, you, the colors that you use, um, we'll look at the, uh, some basic graphic design concepts, but the way things are organized on the screen, even though you may not intend them to mean something, the fact that they're on the screen, um, they're uh, meaningful uh, uh, to the person, regardless of how you intended the meaning. Now, there are some things you can do and to control that. Uh, and I have a few examples in here. Again, earlier I talked about how in most uh, UI studies, people kind of start up here and they kind of go through the screen and, and, and they'll come through it a few different ways. Uh, there are things you can do, though, to control the flow. And so here are just a few simple things. So one is um, by using numbers, for example, you're, you're crafting a different flow 
Uh, most people would start with the one, and then they would go up. Uh, the same thing, uh, just again, this is a simple example, uh, but the same thing as using an arrow. Most people follow the flow of the arrow. So there are things that you can place on the screen, or there's things you can do in how you structure the content on the screen that can control the flow of the information, which then contributes to how uh, they, they acquire the meaning or acquire the information on the screen. So it's a little different than print, because with print, people uh, would read um, a certain way, and, and so you, you are working within that framework. With uh, multimedia, especially with the way people use computer now, uh, computers now, uh, it's a little bit different. So yes, um, someone's asking if these tips are more suitable for asynchronous e-learning. I would say, well, we'll look at some of the, when we talk about the basic uh, graphic design. Uh, some of those concepts work uh, just in terms of the design of, of putting content out in front of people and, and how you uh, get them to understand what, you, what you're sharing. And I, you know, my background and what we're talking about here is probably more suited for the asynchronous type e-learning when you talk about uh, courses that people would go online and take and not necessarily uh, in conjunction with uh, something that's facilitated, like a, a webinar. So if we look at this, and many people know the CRAAP acronym, and so it, it kind of starts with um, the contrast, repetition, alignment, proximity. Um, the these are kind of basic concepts. There's a really good book if you're not familiar with anything like this. Uh, it's Robin Williams, uh, the Non-Designer's Design Book. It's a really good book. And, and she does a great job kind of walking through some of those things and shows a lot of really good examples. We're just going to look at a couple of them because, again, we don't have all the time. So when you think of contrast, you know, you have contrasting colors and things like that. But when you think of contrast and how you can you can craft meaning. You can see, you know, size is one way. Um, again, if if let's say there was nothing on the screen but this right here, and and the instruction was write a story about these boxes, most likely there'd be some story about how this box here is different than this. So maybe it's a a, a group of little boxes, and the big box came to town, or maybe it's this group here, and they're excluding the big box. But whatever it is, the fact that you use size as a contrast and, and the contrast and using size as the way to do the contrast, uh, you can craft meaning. You can help uh, uh, contribute to what you're trying to teach. And then there's other things. So shape, you know, adds contrast, uh, color. Uh, it could be fonts. You can see I've got different fonts, different font colors. And the key thing here is that people focus on what's different. So you can use contrast effectively uh, to draw people's attention to information. Um, yeah, that's a good question about fonts. And we'll actually look at fonts here in a second. And, and that, I think, will answer um, my approach to fonts. I think that's a that will be a better answer for you. Um, so then we'll look at one other element of the CRAAP acronym, and that's proximity. And again, um, when you look at these boxes here, there's no real relationship. You don't see any patterns. But people uh, begin to understand the relationship of elements, and it helps them learn. And so for example, we have the same shapes, but here you know, there's a sense of belonging. Or here, there's something. You know, why is this one not belonging? So one is uh, the proximity implies that there's some relationship, and then this one is out of line. It's also a good use of contrast, because this is all together, and then here's this contrasting element. And then again, uh, you can create, uh, you can craft meaning in how you put elements on your screen, which is really the key point to the graphic design uh, concepts. And so when you're looking at how you're structuring what you put on the screen, applying some basic graphic design ideas is going to contribute to uh, what you're trying to teach. So here's a, this is an interesting one. I got this from a customer. I reworked the slide a little so the person who sent it to me wouldn't recognize it. But I was reviewing this course for somebody, and 
I was going through, and I got to about the ninth or tenth screen, and I said, well, this, this information doesn't make any sense. And so I went backwards, and the reason it didn't make any sense is because the way she had structured the screen, the information was kind of in a pyramid. So I'll throw the question out there. So if you see a pyramid and you see information with a pyramid, what does that imply? So if, you, if you're looking at a screen and, you, and the person put a pyramid on the screen, they have some information stacked, what does the pyramid imply? Right, so there's so you're you're starting to see that, right? So you, that um, typically this is a high point, or maybe the stuff on the bottom is kind of foundational. There are different ways they can structure, but there's usually the pyramid implies some sort of hierarchy of information. So what had happened was, and hers actually looked more like a pyramid. Um, she had structured this information on the screen, so when I was going through it quickly, I assumed that because of the colors, the coloring of the objects and because of the structure that there was a relationship. And then I got to about the ninth slide or so and, and was kind of confused because uh, there was no relationship to the information, so I had to go backwards. And what had happened was uh, these three points are all e essentially equal points. She just put them in, they were actually less text, so they had different size boxes. So. Uh, the small box had less text, and then she liked different colors, so she put different colors on it. So she basically created, if we go back to that proximity and the and the and the contrast element, she had created this relationship with this pyramid shape um, that really wasn't there, but it was just a design idea that she liked. And because of the text in the box, it just changed the shape of the box. So the this bottom box had more text and the little box had less text. So she just stacked them that way. So there was no relationship. But it, it confused the learner who was going through it because the way she structured it did imply a relationship. So we had reworked that with her. And um, you know, again, this is just, again, applying some of the basic design. So you've got real strong contrast with the font. It's easy to, to see the information. Uh, you're using uh, alignment here. You have a, you know, uh, repetitive elements, so it's easy to see. Okay, these are equal points. Now we used her colors, but you know the the problem with colors like this is it kind of could imply that these are different sections. So why why is this purple and this is red uh, and this is green? So it might imply something that's not there. So people are looking at that and they begin to say, oh, you know, I think um, uh, I think these things mean certain things because of the colors. So you've got to be careful how you con uh, create the the content on your screen because even though you might not intend it, it does uh, contribute to uh, what you're doing. So here's the fun part. So hopefully you're still awake. <laughs> so if you're going to design a Western movie poster, what, um, what colors would you have in the Western movie poster? Like a, let's say you're making a cowboy movie. So if it was a cowboy movie, uh, what colors would you use? If I said, okay, your job is to build a uh, a, a movie poster, what colors would you throw in uh, in there? Okay, brown, black, white. What type of fonts would you use? Okay, shiny metallic. I, I probably um, wouldn't use that, but we'll we'll look at that. So the um, the thing though is when you look at that, yeah, you're going to have a the saloon types or that kind of old-fashioned uh, look that kind of looks like a western, right? And most people, if we did this in a in a um, in a, as an activity in a group, they do come up with that kind of the wanted poster look or that kind of burnt or textured old paper. And lo and behold, if you do a search on the internet for Western movie posters, they all start to have uh, that same type of look. And I was doing the same thing with a mafia because I reworked the exercise. So I was looking at like mafia movies and all the mafia movie posters, 
they all have black, white, and red. So it really doesn't matter what the what it's about. It's just all black, white, and red. So the thing is, there's a visual voice that that's talking to you. So somebody says Western movie poster, and you kind of already know what it looks like when you go to the movies and you're looking at the previews at the posters on the wall there. Uh, the, those people who are designing those posters, they're speaking to your visual voice. They're saying this is how the course or this is what this movie is about. So they're using things that are common to what you see or what you expect uh, to, to, to craft um, that poster. And you can do the same thing when you uh, build your courses. So we'll actually go through this quickly. But when you build a course, uh, you can use that visual voice. So here's an exercise we do. And again, we can, we'll can we go through it really fast. But let's say this was a screen. So this is just a kind of a PowerPoint looking screen. The whole rainforest here, this is up in Washington State. And, um, and let's say this was a course. And these right here are going to be different trees that you can learn about. So we want to make those clickable and, and you can learn about the trees. So we have kind of a mind map activity that we uh, take people through uh, where they can kind of work through this concept of what, what should the course look like. Why not, let's tap into the visual voice of the course. In this case, it's this rainforest. So what we do is we want to end up with something that looks a little bit more like this. So you want to create a more visual, uh, a, a visual experience that's closer to the content. And in a sense, you know, when we were building this mock-up, I was saying, we want to kind of bring the people into the rainforest. So what can you do when you're building your, your course? How can you bring them uh, into the rainforest? Or if you're, if you're teaching finance course, what is, you know, a finance course is going to look different than a course maybe on operating room technology. So the people are going to be dressed different. You might have different colors. So all that stuff in your brain, you've already kind of figured that out. So it's how do I take it from my brain and put it on paper. So we actually have this activity. And when you look at a course, um, you kind of have you know, just a few elements. So you're going to have colors on the screen. You're going to have elements. And those could be uh, pictures, shapes, whatever you want to do, some design elements. And then you're going to have your fonts or your typography. And we kind of throw people in there, even though people are really uh, elements. We kind of throw the people in there as separate because uh, one thing that is effective in e-learning is if you can add people to a course, it helps you uh, helps people connect uh, to the course. So we kind of throw that in there. So this could be people or it could be characters. And then uh, when you start to look for inspiration, there's a lot of ways uh, you can do that. I personally like to look at magazines that are representative of the industry. And I like to look at movie posters because you already have professional uh, designers who are kind of coming up with concepts. And so sometimes you can find a concept that will work in your e-learning course. So we're actually going to walk through this uh, pretty quickly. So if we were going to do this exercise, we would say, OK, you've you got the whole rainforest. This is just a brain dump. So you really don't have to, um, OK, well, I'll, I'll take my time then on that. Um, with the whole rainforest, uh, it's just a um, it's a rainforest, right? So we're going to do a brain dump, and so you're basically going to go through a, this mind map. And if you don't like mind maps, some people look at a mind map and their eyes start rolling backwards. Uh, that's okay. You can just make these columns and just list them in the columns. The main thing is uh, what you want to do is kind of write out some ideas. So what what comes to mind first? Uh, when you're thinking about this. So in this case, we want to put the learner in the rainforest. So this first, this first leg is elements. So what, what are screen elements? So those could be you know, rainforest. And, and this is the whole rainforest. So in our area, it's probably a little different than the rainforest that you might have in your part of the world. So in our area, it's, it's a lot of ferns and, and pine trees and, and moss and things like that. So when I'm going to list the elements, I just might make a list of those things that I think are uh, things that make me think of the rainforest or elements that I can use. So, uh, And then I'm trying to remember what I put on there. OK, so let me, I fleshed out all the way. So then uh, on typography, what you want to do is kind of list fonts. So 
The same thing with the movie posters. The movie posters, you kind of knew what type of font makes a Western poster. You're not going to use that OCR font or the one that looks like it comes from a computer. If it's a Western movie poster, you already know what that font should look like. You might not know the title of the font, but you do know what the font looks like. And you'll know if a font's the right font or not. If you're doing something informal with kids, you're probably not going to use a formal font, or you're not going to, if you're doing something with computers, you're not going to use an old you know, font from the 1500s, uh, that uh, calligraphy type font. So there's a font that matches the context of what you're doing. So even if you don't know the name of the font, you can just list fonts. So for example, uh, for elements, we might have things like uh, trees or fern, moss, uh, mist, you know, whatever we can think of, and then we just fill that out. And then with typography, we might say, okay, it's about the forest, so what we want to do is let's find an organic font or let's find a twiggy font. So you might not know the names of fonts, but you can just go ahead and, and just list what you think the font should look like. The nice thing is that you can go to these font sites and you can just type in organic and um, they'll probably give you 10 or so fonts that you can uh, look at that give you an organic uh, look. And then uh, we have the people here. So what you want to do is kind of what type of people would you see in the rainforest or what type of characters? Because you may be building a course, again, depending on the context. You know, if I was doing a uh, forest course here in the U.S., we have uh, Smokey the Bear. So he's kind of a mascot for forests and forest fires. So I might want to use a, a bear or, uh, you know, some sort of animal creature. So it doesn't have to be uh, people, but what type of characters uh, would you find in the rainforest? So it could be an owl. It could be a ranger, tourist, a researcher. So you want to make a list of that. What's interesting is uh, one of the people I was talking to, they had done this exercise with their client and to kind of help them. So your client also has that visual voice, and they have a mental picture of what uh, the course should look like, but they're not always able to tell you what it looks like. A lot of times they're able to tell you what they want after you've done your work. <laughs> so what you want to do um, is get them to think about it before you do the work. So doing a mind map exercise like this is good. And one of the people I was talking to said they were doing uh, this with the people, and they had um, built out the people characters, and the um, client was looking at it and said, well, you know, the uh, characters look too American, and we actually have a more global audience, and we need to have our characters look less American. See, he would never have known that had he not uh, gone through this exercise. And then uh, the rest of this, you're just going to look for things that will inspire uh, some design ideas. I like to go with movie posters. Uh, a lot of times, you know, if we're doing the rainforest, what movies are foresty? Maybe, you know, Avatar or um, there's a movie in the U.S. called Grizzly Adams. Uh, different movies like that uh, that might remind me of the topic that I'm doing. And then I can look at their look at the the covers of those movies or look at clips from the movie to get some ideas. Uh, Rainforest, again, I may look at National Geographic magazine. A lot of the trade journals, they already have fonts and they have color schemes and they've designed, you know, magazines will always have little pullouts or bullets and th different things that they've done that um, you can probably use as inspiration uh, for your own course. And then from that, you kind of want to pull a color scheme. So once you kind of go through the mind map, and we do this as, a, as an activity. It usually takes about half an hour. And then we break up in groups. And they'll, they'll populate it, and they'll end up with something that looks like this. So for elements, we've got wood and paper and branches. And we've listed some fonts and different types of people. Then once you have some ideas down, you just go to Google, uh, do some image searches, and try to find some pictures to represent your idea. At this point, you don't need to worry about copyright or anything because you're not going to use these in your course. It's just to kind of give you a visual uh, map. Then you might end up with something like this. So you've got, you've got uh, some pictures that kind of represent what you're thinking. 
you've got some fonts, uh, you pulled some characters, uh, here's some movies, you can see you've got a color scheme. Again, here, this is why I like magazines. You can see the magazines, they already have a structure and layout to them, and that makes it easy uh, for you to kind of look at what, they, what these professional graphic designers did uh, for that. And um, so then what you can do is, if you did this with your client beforehand, they're going to help you go through it. Maybe they say, you know, we don't want clip art. We want real people. Or, you know, we want certain type of people. Uh, or, you know what, um, I want the colors from this tree. And that's kind of what I want as a color theme. What's nice is uh, you can take those photos, upload them to these sites now, and then they'll actually um, pull a color palette for you. And then once you have that, you've got a color palette that you can work with. See, now when you start to work on your course, you're not going out. This is what I find when I talk to people. They start to build their, they have this content, and then what they do is they go out and they do an image search and they spend two days looking for pictures, and then they let the pictures dictate uh, what the course is going to look like, and then maybe they come up with a color scheme. Everything they do is not intentional. So what you want to do is you want to be intentional in what you're doing. So when you go through this activity, it really doesn't take long. Uh, you've got some pictures to guide you here. You've got a few fonts that you can consider. You know, you've kind of thought about people. And then you've got uh, some pictures or the color scheme to work with. And, and hopefully you find a place of inspiration that's going to help you, especially if you don't have a, a graphic design background. So let's go ahead and apply that, and you'll see uh, how we get from one step to the next. Now, we're using PowerPoint in our example here, but this really is is the approach you should take regardless of uh, the application you use. If you're building it in Flash or whatever, uh, you still want to be intentional how you design uh, the look and feel of your course. So what we start with is, you know, here's our slide. and uh, it doesn't look foresty, right? So you've got this weird green. Uh, the green just doesn't match the rest of it. You've got this blockiness. And again, you know, when you think of a forest, it's kind of organic. So that's the feel we want. We want an organic. I want to take this learner who's learning about the rainforest and put them in the rainforest. If I'm doing a course on finance, I want to put them at the place where they're going to be interacting with that content. Maybe they're at a desk. Maybe they're in an office. They're in an operating room. They're going to be in the operating room. They're not going to be on a white slide with uh, black text. They, we want to put them where they're learning about what they're doing. So in this case, we've got this slide. What we're going to do is change up the background. So we're going to put them in the rainforest, right? So we've got our rainforesty background. It's a little bit more organic. Now the problem is you can't read anything. So what we want to do is... Um, create a place to read stuff. So what we're going to do here is, uh, well, one is we took wood. So I don't know if you can see that, how well that shows up on here. But this is actually a wood plank. So this is going to be where we have our icons and all of this. So we'll, this will be our content area. And then this is where we'll have our clickable icons. So uh, we've got our, we've kind of got this planned out. Then what we're going to do is add a, um, our content area. Now, and this is pretty easy to do. One of the things we did is we kind of followed the flow of the tree, and it's just basically a white shape, and we put a slight um, uh, transition to it here to where it softens the edges. And in PowerPoint 2007 and 10, uh, that's easy enough to do. And all graphics tools will have some sort of uh, capability to do that. But we basically softened up the edges. The other thing you'll notice is we didn't go with a stark, uh, stark white. Um, what we did is we actually made the, the background somewhat transparent so that um, there's some texture to the screen. And so you kind of still feel like you're in there. Somebody was saying it kind of looks misty like the fog that you might have up in the rainforest up in this area. So what we want to do now is let's get rid of the font, and we're going to replace it. Now, this is a thing you want to consider. When you're working with fonts, 
uh, and you're you're better off just working with two or three fonts and just sticking with that. That's why you want to do the brain that that mind map activity, and then you pre-select your fonts. So what you want is a title font, and then you want a body font, and usually two fonts is plenty. Um, what you can do is maybe a third font if you want to highlight uh, information. Sometimes I like to use like a handwritten font as a great way to add some uh, contrast uh, to the information on the screen. But again, one of those common problems that you see uh, in e-learning courses or uh, advertisements for e-learning webinars is that there's 20 fonts on the screen. <laughs> so the, um, the thing is, if you can settle with like two fonts, that's actually going to help you come up with a cleaner design. So you pick a nice title font and, um, and then pick a body font that people can read. In this case, there's not a lot of text, so we went with kind of a simple organic font. But if you have a lot of text, then you might want a different font that's more legible and easier uh, to read. Uh, but then with the, this is perfect for a uh, title font, but you would never use this type of font uh, for the body font. But in either case, we've got our fonts. We put them on there. Now this right here, again, we go with, we're looking at an organic line, and, and this, this squared shape just doesn't look right. So we'll get rid of the square tree and we're just going to replace it with something that's a bit more organic looking. And that's just a matter of finding a cutout tree. And um, you, can, you can do that in PowerPoint 2010 now, or you can use you know, any graphics editor and uh, remove the background. And you get that more organic uh, look uh, to this. So then it now it looks a little bit more like you're in the forest. I think if you take a deep breath, you might even smell uh, or take a deep whiff, you might smell the pine. Um, and then, then we added some other elements. So here the, uh, the the buttons that were bullet points are now buttons in here. You can see we've, again, used that font. And then here's a good example of uh, using a handwritten uh, font. Uh, I like to do that because it's got a nice um, a nice way to add contrast. And sometimes it's got that informal, like, oh, look, the person wrote a special note for me. So it kind of draws your attention to that uh, when, you're, uh, when you're working with your screens. But in either case, it's a really simple transition. It looks you know, a lot richer. I think I have a before and after here. Nope. Um, but it looks a lot richer than that original screen. And that's kind of what you want to do with that exercises. Walk through this process where you're intending to design the look and feel of your course rather than relying on a template, which is what Benedict was act asking about earlier. So you create a look that's unique to the content and to the context of what you're trying to teach. And it really doesn't matter. I mean, you can even if you're doing presentations, you can still apply the same concept uh, to the presentations and then use that um, in how you structure your content as well. But the main thing is you want to be intentional in what your course looks like. So even if it's just a white background or a PowerPoint template that you're using, you, you, you're making that decision to do that. So the course is going to look like something. Uh, this type of exercise will actually help you uh, build the right look and feel for your course. And really getting you to tap into that visual voice or the expectations uh, people have uh, for their course. And so that's a good exercise. And if you want to go through that, and you can download the stuff. We have that on that link I shared. And I'm sure it will be available to you after the session as well. And then we have a whole course where we walk through that how to change a tire course. And we start with that basic PowerPoint. And then we walk through to where you get something that looks more engaging. So the, the main thing here is, uh, getting the look and feel of your course to match the content of what you're doing. Any questions? I, I'm at the, you know, at the final point, but I slowed it down a little because you guys said I could. So I'm willing to keep going. I know some of you probably came in and need to leave, and that's fine. Um, but I, I can keep going if you'd like. And okay. And then um, if you have to leave. It's okay. You'll get all of the um, all of that information is available to you uh, anyway. All right. So 
This third leg of it is kind of the rapid instructional design. And uh, probably the biggest transition people make in uh, e-learning is uh, and that probably when, when it gets to creating engaging and effective courses, is how do we get away from just sharing information and how do we create learner-centric content or content that uh, the learner uh, is going to do something with it, right? So that's, that's kind of the big aha for most people in e-learning is how do, I, how do I get away from just this information dumping and how do I get to something that's more learner-centric? So I'll share a few ideas. So the very first thing I would tell people is the more relevant the content is to the person, the um, you've already hit that key point in interactivity. So the um, if you want to make your courses engaging and interactive, make sure that you're making it relevant uh, to the learners. Uh, the worst thing is you can build the most in interactive content, but if they have no uh, interest in the content, they're not motivated to learn, then um, you know they're not going to learn. So if it's relevant, though, they're less inclined to focus on the bells and whistles anyway in the course, and more inclined the uh, more inclined um, oh, did I quote it wrong? Oh, the um, anyway, if they're <laughs> if they're um, if the if the if the content's relevant to them, then uh, they're more inclined to just be engaged in the content. And I always have this example. I a few years ago, I'd gotten laid off, and so I had all this time. So I decided I was going to work on some home improvement projects, and we were going to put crown molding up on the ceiling, and. You know, I, I, I'm not a handyman by any means. And uh, so I went to put some, um, it's not too late in Seattle. It's only 7 o'clock. So I had put some um, regular molding up on the walls, the chair rail molding, and, and that was pretty easy. But crown molding is a little different because there's a compound angle. And uh, what was funny was I hadn't accommodated the, um, compound angle so I just did a regular you know 45 degree cut on the on the crown molding and then I went to go put it up at the ceiling and realized that uh, the angle was off so I was like oh great I just wasted an expensive piece of crown molding so I went to the next piece and I thought I'd try to eyeball it and guesstimate it and uh, guesstimating and carpentry doesn't go hand in hand um, so then I said okay there's got to be some way you cut this stuff right so I went online and started doing some research. And what's funny is I found one site. It had the history of crown molding, everything you could possibly learn about crown molding. And eventually I got to a place where uh, there was um, information on how to cut the molding. Unfortunately, it was all in Greek because it, it looked like it was all calculus or whatever. So I was like, well, that's not going to help me at all. So then I found some other site, and this guy had like four steps on how to cut crown molding, and I was able to follow his steps and get it done. The thing, though, is as I was searching, and you know, I had a need, and when I was looking for information, the information itself didn't meet my need. But when I found information that met my need, I was engaged, so I was looking for something, I had, I had a quest, and as I was pursuing that, I was collecting information, and then uh, I was motivated and engaged in that process. Nowhere in there did I say, well, you know, this Google site is lame because it's all white and it's just text. There's no, uh, there's no interactivity in the Google site. There's no interactivity on the Internet. So I wasn't, I wasn't concerned by those things because uh, – I was engaged because I was looking for information on how to learn how to cut crown molding, and so the information that was relevant to my needs uh, was engaging me and kind of worked with my motivation. And so I would say the same thing. Before you start looking at all of the bells and whistles and all the cool things you can do leveraging multimedia with, 
you know, drag and drop activities and different types of activities that can really enhance the learning, the first thing I would do is say make sure that the content that you build is relevant to the learner. So tap into what the learner's needs are and, and build content that, that meets their needs. And in a sense, when you're building a course, you have uh, you, you have uh, one end, say, the client or the person who's building content or who wants this content built. And then on the other end, you have the learner. And they don't necessarily have the same needs or objectives. And then you as the instructional designer or course developer, you're kind of in the middle. So you're a bridge to the client because you've got to help the client uh, meet their objectives. And then at the other side, you're also helping the um, learner uh, learn. So you've got this this process where you're kind of the, the bridge between the client and the client meeting their objectives and then the learner and the learner being able to learn. So that's you know that's a large part of your role in instructional design is kind of bridging uh, those those two interests. Um, I'll answer the question about the interactivity here in a second. The the key thing I think is when you talk about getting this done simply is uh, this difference between pushing and pulling content. So typically we push content out and what we want to do is get the learner to pull the content. So uh, the more it's like with me with looking for the crown molding, I was engaged because I had a reason to go out and look for information and use the information. So when you're building a course, it's how do I get the learner to go pull information. So I would say um, it's kind of building a, a structure in your course where they're making decisions rather than you giving them information, give them uh, questions or give them things that they need to make decisions on. And if they're not quite confident on the decisions, uh, give them a means to collect information so they can make an informed decision. So you let them uh, pull information rather than you pushing the information, I think, is a key thing. Now, going back to the, the question about defining interactivity and uh, the Apple book, I haven't used the Apple book. I, to me, that's just a means to create um, multimedia content regardless of, you know, there's obviously different tools have different levels of interactivity. But I would say the interactivity, the core function is, you know, how, how is the, you, got, you, have, you actually have two elements. So how is the person uh, actually interacting with the screen? So I like to call it touching the screen so you can build a course. So people like rollovers and people like clicking on things. They like dragging things. So that's not, you know, a lot of people would call those bells and whistles. But that plays in a an important part in the course because the more you get them engaged in touching the screen, uh, the more engaged they are. And then the other part of interactivity is how do you get them to use the content? So again, going back to the pull, instead of pushing information out there, how do you get them to pull information? So I'd say there's a two-pronged process to interactivity. One is the things they can do to touch the screen, you know, to, to interact with the screen. And then the other part is uh, where they can actually interact with the content and make decisions and get feedback and, and those types of things. So when you look at it, you know, I, I use this example because it's actually from a case study or a real example that I ran into when, you know, a few years back. I was working with this executive and they wanted to do all this policy training for uh, new managers. And so I was telling the executive, I said, well, you know, I don't know how it is where you're at, but us little people, <laughs> now when we come to work, we go to our cubicles and we just start working. We don't go to the cubicles and uh, pull down policy manuals and just start reading policy manuals to determine how we should do our work. And so if I was going to train somebody on company's policies, I'm not going to have them go pull policy manuals and read policy manuals or give them a bunch of information about policies. What I want to do is get them to make decisions that are compliant with the company's policies because that's really what happens in real life. So what people, uh, what people do is they do their jobs and something happens 
and then they make a decision, and the company hopes that they're compliant with the policies. But you don't know until they make a decision. So if you're going to train them on policies, instead of giving them a bunch of information about policies, why not just give them a bunch of decisions so that they're able to uh, make the decisions that you would want them to make. And then at the point they make decisions, you can give them feedback uh, that kind of helps them learn about the company's policies. So in this case, and the tell me might be, you know, here's what the company policy says, blah, blah, blah. Or, you know, Joe fell down. What should you do? I don't know. If I know, if I know the company's policy, then I can just make a decision and I'll get my feedback. If I don't know the company's policy, then I'm going to go pull it, right? So that's that's the key. So I'm going to, if I design the course, I'm going to give them a way uh, to collect this information. And at that point, when they're collecting the information, um, they're going to be able to make a decision. So here we would just give them company policy. Here we give them a reason to go find the company policy. So that's a, a simple way to do it, but that's usually um, the approach I take when I build a course is, you know, there's this information you want to give them. Why do they need the information, or what do you hope that information is going to do for them? And then how do you know it's doing it? Well, because they're using it to make decisions. Well, what decisions do they need to make? And then let's build our training around those decisions. And so we'll create a bunch of decision points, and it, that's how they're going to get the information rather than us just pushing the information on them. So that's kind of the key thing there. And then I have what I call, I can't go into a lot of detail with this, but I'll be writing more on the blog about this. But I have what I call these rapid instructional design models. And the reason uh, I like this is because a lot of people who build e-learning courses, they don't have a formal background in instructional design. So a lot of complaints that I hear from all the experts, which you know I would say don't listen to the experts a lot of times, but um, a lot of experts will complain that you have people using these tools and they don't know how to build courses. And and, and some part they're probably right, but you know I was looking at this this inflatable thing a few years back, and what's interesting is there's this company and they make these shelters here. So they make these shelters. And what the shelter is, it's this inflatable hut that they drop. So they'll drop a case. Then somebody will hook a um, some sort of fan up to it. He's not pushing it. I think it would take him a few hours. <laughs> but they usually hook a fan up to it, and it inflates, and it comes up here. And then what they do is they take a hose, right? And so they spray it down. And this this thing right here is covered with this concrete mesh. And when they spray it down with water, it turns into this hardened shell that's kind of a nice structure. And they can actually cut these open then. And they, they're they all hermetically sealed. And they can have operating rooms in there, They temporary shelter. And these things will last like 10 years or so out there exposed. Um, what was neat about that, and I think it's a good example of these rapid instructional design models, you know, the person who inflates this doesn't need to be a trained engineer. They're not a chemist or uh, the architect of, uh, of these things here. It's just somebody who learned uh, how to put air in it and how to wet it down. And then they created a good structure. And I think you can do the same thing in e-learning, especially if you're working with subject matter experts who you're trying to get them to do more of the course development. So uh, when we look at that, I kind of see you have these, I call them rapid instructional design models. But I have these little models that are like Legos. And you can kind of put them together to build your course. So I'll show you. I think I've got, well, I guess I didn't put them in here because I knew I didn't have enough time. But I'll explain a couple of them that I have. So one of them I have. It, I call it the II model, or the Gilligan is what we call it at work here. And um, it's an information interaction. So a lot of times I'm working with um, clients, and you can't get them to get rid of any information. But you want to make it the course interactive. So what I'll do is I'll say, hey, let's do 
an II model. So on one side, we'll have an information track. So we'll structure a nice way to present the information. And then we'll build an interactive track. And what's nice is if you design it right, you can kind of steer everybody to the interactive track and then uh, and have a really engaging course. But the client's happy because they get all this information in the course as well. So I call that the Gill again. And so it's kind of this information interaction track. Another model we have is the RSI. So it's a rapid situational interaction. And that one I have outlined on that link uh, that you got. And the, the idea of the rapid situational interaction is what we do is uh, you, you reframe the content and, and you phrase questions. So you're getting them, instead of pushing the information, getting them to pull it. So it's kind of a, you create a situational or it's relevant situation interaction. So you create a relevant situation with some viable choices. And they make a choice, and then you give them the information. It's actually kind of a clever little model, if you see it in detail, um, because it's really a click and read course. But it doesn't appear as a click and read course uh, for the learner taking it. And for the person who has to build it, it's a simple way to take what would be click and read content and make it more engaging. And it, and it actually forces you, in the, as a course designer, to reframe your content to be relevant. So it's a simple, it's a click and read course, but it doesn't look click and read. But what's nice about these models is I was working on a course with one of our guys here at Articulate. And we had met with a client. We were doing a project for that Lingos, uh, that humanitarian group. And the client had 40 Word documents. And we had gone through that. And so after the meeting, I met with David, who works for me. And I said, OK, here's what we're going to do. We're going to do a gill again. And then for the interactive part, we're going to use an RSI. We knew the model, what the models meant. And so in about 30 seconds, we had the framework for our courses. And then we were able to use uh, that structure uh, to build our course. And we were able to build it uh, pretty quickly. So it only took us a couple days uh, to build that course out using that model. So the, and I've got a few of these things. I'll be writing more about these in the blog. But the thing is, you can pre-build some models, and then you can reuse those. And a good way, there's no magic to that. A lot of times, I'll look at commercials. Uh, and I wrote about this in the blog post today. Uh, but I'll look at commercials, and I'll try to break down the commercial and say, how do they transition from one thing to the next? Or how are they sharing the information? And then as you write it out, you say, you know, that's kind of a neat way to do that. I'm going to build a model. So the next time I need to build a course, I kind of have a template for how I want the, the flow of the course to work. And so then I can use that template uh, when I build a course. I have another model. I can't, again, I don't have the time to go into all the detail of it. But I call it the usual suspects. It's kind of built around a crime drama type structure that you might have in a crime show. But I use that model, and that model would work in any content. So I don't need to know what the content is. I could, I could already say, I know when I go into this next course, I'm going to use the usual suspects model. And I can build an interactive course. And I'll already know how to collect and organize my content before I even do the course. And it's still going to, regardless of the course content or context, it's going to be a structure that's going to make the course uh, relevant and engaging for the learner. So those are things you can do. So create relevant content, find ways to get the learner to pull information, and then kind of pre-design some models, and then teach those to your subject matter experts. And then you can uh, get them to build courses that are a little bit more interactive. And then uh, you're going to have more learner-centric design uh, in your courses. And so as a recap, we have uh, Kind of you get the basic, you know, start with the basics. So if you're just getting started or you have the sloppy looking courses, uh, we've got to start somewhere. My first course that I ever built probably will never be seen by anybody. And, uh, but I can tell you it wasn't very good. Um, so you've got to start somewhere and then work towards creating a nice, basic, consistent, viable course using some you know, core concepts. And then uh, work on this, uh, creating that immersive look and feel for your course, and then uh, start working on 
some interactive stuff. And this again, this is that this is an example, and you can find that on that link. This is the RSI model that we used uh, for the do-it-yourself tire changing course. And so you can look at that and see how that's structured. We, ex we explain that in a little bit more detail. But this right here is basically just the PowerPoint slide. And really, the learner thinks he has choices here. But this is really just one big next button. It doesn't really matter what they choose. They go to a slide that gives them uh, different feedback. So they, they might think that they're going to uh, different slides based on their decision making, but they don't really know that. So. Uh, it's a really simple model, uh, but it, it definitely helps you get away from that click and read uh, type content. And then uh, that's basically it. And I think there's the information. And you know, I'll stick around for questions if you have some. Thank you for your patience. I actually enjoyed being able to spend a little bit more time on this. And if you have any questions, you can always email me as well. So normal development time to build 30 minutes. Um, you know, really, it really depends. The, um, you know, I actually had a good process in place at the last place I worked at where I actually trained my subject matter experts to do most of my course development. So I didn't have to do a lot of work. And so I would say like 30 minutes using the models. If you have a model in place, and you know you can learn about the RSI and the other thing, if you have a model in place, uh, it, you'll you already kind of know how you need to structure your content. If you go through like that mind map type activity or something like that, um, and you're more intentional in the design of your course, you're going to spend a lot less time uh, looking at pictures and looking for clip bar and looking for fonts and all that stuff. So. A 30-minute course, rapid e-learning. You know, I could we, I could probably crank something out in a few days. I would say a week to two weeks uh, for some basic design work. You know, a lot of that's always based on uh, the content you have available to you, how much you have to rework the content, and uh, the review process and all of that. But you know, I was always pretty good at able. I was able to get pretty decent courses built in that one to two week uh, window. Uh, but I, I will admit I'm pretty fast, pretty fast at some of this stuff. So it's probably not fair to to think everybody uh, should work at that speed. And if you have more detailed questions, you know you can always email me, and then uh, it's easier to answer them that way too. So yeah, with the SMEs, um, there's a few things. One is. And, and I'll give you a couple of things that you can do. So Kathy Moore, if you go to her site, I think it's kathy-moore.com. She's got two uh, good demo posts in there. So the first one is um, dump the drone. So I would do a search for that. And then the other one is her action mapping concept. So what you want to do is get the SMEs exposed to that type of information. Because they've all taken bad e-learning courses, the, the challenge for a lot of people is that you, know, you go to school, right? And school is mostly lecture and reading or looking at you know, PowerPoint slides and those types of things. And um, you know, everywhere you go, you know, religious organizations, you know, you go to church, there's somebody lecturing you, right? So there's a structure that's common to education. So when people go to build courses, they kind of build their courses like the, what they're familiar with. So they build courses based on uh, here's information, and I'm just going to share the information with you. So they don't think about other types of things. So the thing you want to do is get them to see it in a different way. So Dump the Drone is good because she does a good job walking you through the process of uh, getting away from kind of that e-learning speak and into something that's more uh, uh, real to the learner. And then the other thing is she does a good job on the action mapping on how do you, how do you get to more action-based learning. So if you can get your subject matter experts to look at something like that, uh, they're relatively easy, and they'll understand it. You don't have to, they don't have to be instructional designers. And if you can take content 
your own content from your organization and rework it using some of those concepts, then you have those treatments you can show them. And I would kind of work from that. And so you build like a style guide. You get two fonts. You know, you're going to use this mind map activity uh, to build the look and feel. You could probably scale it back a little and just what pictures do you need, what fonts do you need, what um, colors do you need, you know, something like that. So they're kind of thinking through those things before uh, they actually start working on the course. Any other questions? All right. Well, thank you for having me. I enjoyed it. And um, if you have any questions, like I said earlier, you know, take a look at those links because there's all sorts of resources on there. And, uh, and then you can email me. And uh, if I can't answer the questions, I'll at least try to get you pointing in the right direction. And in terms of all those instructional design models, I'm actually working on some blog posts and examples for that. So those will be shown up in the blog soon. Instructional design models. I'm actually working on some blog posts and examples soon. <laughs> yeah. Zaid, <laughs> uh, that's a, it's a great example of how not to use fonts. <laughs> All right, I'm going to turn off my mic now. Okay, hello, can everybody hear me? Okay, okay, can, can everybody just first, I just want to say to Tom, thank you very much for participating in this. And I'm really happy about it because we actually recorded the session, so we have actually uh, can make it available to others also afterwards. The only thing I'm a bit disappointed is my marketing strategy because I thought at least we will have 80, but somehow only 30, 38 turn up on the peak period. But anyway, it was it was absolutely fantastic, and I think we have to remember the three steps. Okay, first is. We have to start converting our course by having some consistency, not like my blog having fonts everywhere, but I was actually just exploring by the way. I learned a lot through that process also. And secondly, we need to make it look better. We need bells and whistles, but the bells and whistles should be relevant, okay? And finally, we want to make it interactive, engage the user. And many ways to engage the users, sometimes it's clicks, sometimes it's just asking a question that makes them think. So I think from this session, we learned so much, and, and I'm, I don't know how to appreciate you uh, in that sense, but we will, I'll get back to you on how we can appreciate you in other ways. Uh, but thank you very, very much, and uh, I hope that uh, we can interact more, because I am used an Articulate fanatic, and we're using Articulate in so many ways, and I think this lesson alone, the recorded version, will be helpful to all our lectures, and also all whoever wants to watch it again. And thank you very much. And maybe you want to say a last thing before we close the show. I'll stop the recording. I'm going to stop my broadcast now. I just appreciate being able to do this. And um, thank you for uh, having me. And you don't need to show me any appreciation. I just enjoy doing this. So I hope you all have a great day today and uh, or tomorrow for me. And um, again, if you have any questions, feel free to contact me. Bye.